Amen, amen, amen. Thank you so much, Sister Nicola. That is so powerful. Thank you very much. Um, without wasting any time, I'd like to welcome the servants of God. Pastor Marks, Pastor Marks, uh, we welcome you in a special way. Um, this, today's our last day. It has been such a powerful, anointed week, you know. Um, I needed this. I needed this. And you made it so easy for a person who's facilitating for the first time. You made it so easy for me. Thank you so much. You, you just, it's literally you held my hand. Your sermons were really powerful. You know, they made me feel so lightened up, so fired up to want to come here without being fearing. You made it so easy because the Holy Spirit was resting upon you. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, good morning. Uh, good morning, everyone, all of you, my brothers and sisters. This is the day the Lord has made. Let's rejoice and be glad in it. Happy Sabbath to you. And as I promised, I will thank Sister Sithobo, and I believe I have gotten your name correctly. I had some significant coaching from my elder who initial contact. I, I spoke to him last night. I said, you got to bail me out. You have to bail me out. And uh, he said it a few times. And uh, I... I, I, all day I was memorizing it. I said, um, I'm going to give it a shot because this is my last morning with you. You've done a magnificent job. Everyone who has prayed, uh, everyone who has been on this platform, just to keep your numbers as high as they have been all week, is for me quite a testimony. Uh, we do this in the United States, but uh, I think there is so much to learn from you the way you uh, rally and at five in the morning, you're ready to pray, you're ready to praise God and you're ready for the proclamation of his word. As you know, I am pastoring in the Northeastern Conference in the United States and I live in New York City and uh, I am hoping to make my first trip to Africa. I did say that to El Easy Mubinga, uh, in August, we should be heading to Ghana. But he told me something that some of you will agree with. He said, you have not been to Africa until you come to South Africa. So I hope, I hope soon one day to set foot in the great nation and somehow at least connect with a few of you, depending on where I am. If you are here in the United States at any time, I hope you will try to make contact, especially if you're in the New York metropolitan area. It'll be relatively easy to find me. Of course, if you're on Twitter, I am on Twitter. The Twitter handle is Marks Easton, my last name first. And I'm on Facebook. Uh, so God bless you all, especially our young people and young adults, the teenagers and young adults. I pray for you and I want all of you to continue praying for me. To the elders, uh, to our sisters, all of you, thank you so much for the love. I felt it and your worship certainly motivates us to worship God and serve him until we see him face to face. So this time we are going to pray and we are going to get into our meditation for this morning. On yesterday, we talked about the unlikeliest personal miracle. And as I promised, today we are going to talk about the unlikeliest corporate miracle. Let us pray. Gracious Father, speak to us now. I pray, we pray. Counsel us for today. May the flame of hope and peace and joy burn in our hearts today. Help us as we worship with our brothers and sisters to do so in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name. The story is from the first century BC. A devastating drought threatened to destroy the generation before Jesus. The last of the Jewish prophets had died nearly four centuries before. Miracles were such a distant memory 
that they seemed like a false memory. And God was nowhere to be heard. But there was a man who lived outside Jerusalem's walls who dared to pray anyway. Even if people could no longer hear God, Honey believed that God could still hear them. He was the people's only hope. Famous for his ability to pray for rain, it was on this day that Honey earned his moniker. With a six foot staff in hand, he began to turn like a math compass. 90 degrees, 180, 270, 360 degrees. He never looked up at the crowd as the crowd looked on. After what seemed like hours, but had only been seconds, Honey stood inside the circle he had drawn, then dropped to his knees and raised his hands to heaven. With the authority of the prophet Elijah, who had called down fire from heaven, he called down rain. Lord of the universe, he prayed, I swear before your great name that I will not move from this circle until you have shown mercy upon your children. His words made the people shudder. It wasn't just the volume of his voice. It was the authority of his tone. His prayer was resolute yet humble, confident yet meek, expectant yet unassuming. And then it happened. As his prayer ascended, raindrops descended. An audible gasp swept through the thousands who had encircled him. Every head turned heavenward as the first raindrops parachuted from the sky, but his head, his head remained bowed. The people rejoiced over each drop, but he wasn't satisfied with a drizzle. Still kneeling within the circle, he lifted his voice over the sounds of celebration and said, not for such rain have I prayed, but for rain that will fill pits and caverns and cisterns. The drizzle, brothers and sisters, became a torrential downpour. It rained so heavily, flooding began. Once more, Honey refined his bold request and said, not for such rain have I prayed, but for the rain of thy favor, blessing and graciousness. And then, believe it or not, it began to rain calmly. Each raindrop was a tangible token of God's grace. And they didn't just soak the skin, they soaked the spirit with faith. It would be forever remember as the day, the day puddle jumping became an act of praise, the day the legend of the circle maker was born. The circle that he drew in the sand became a sacred symbol as the legend of Honey the circle maker stands forever as a testament to the power of a single prayer that changed the course of history. Brothers and sisters, circle making was initiated by God himself under the leadership of Joshua. Israel had arrived at its first battleground in the land of Canaan, Jericho. Jericho was heavily fortified throughout its history for a simple reason. It was the gateway to Canaan. You got to Jericho before you got to the rest of Canaan. And consequent upon that, they built walls around Jericho. When Israel got into Canaan, archaeologists said Jericho had two walls, a wider lower wall, about six feet wide, and a higher upper wall, which was about 40 feet high. Two walls. The lower one was six feet wide. The higher one was about 40 feet in height. Israel's spies had gone over, you remember? Moses had sent them, and they came back. Only two of them were optimistic. Ten said the walls were impregnable. The walls were insurmountable. According to Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 8, they said the cities are large with walls up to the sky. In other words, Moses, this is mission impossible. Well, God was about to prove that with him, all things are possible. As commander in chief, the Lord appeared before Joshua with a drawn sword. Terrified, Joshua asked, are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied, neither. Praise God this morning. Praise God, he does not take sides. I can hear him saying, I am neither for South Africa nor North Africa, neither for the East nor 
the West. I am hearing God saying in my heart this morning, I'm not for white folks and against blacks. I'm not for blacks and against whites. Listen to me. God says, I'm not for Christians and against Muslims. Let me also say, the same God is saying, I'm not for Seventh-day Adventists and against Anglicans and Baptists and Catholics. I'm neither. Thank God. He doesn't take sides. God refuses to be defined by who he is for and who he is against. Let me say that again. He refuses to be defined by who he is for and who he is against. He does not want us to define him by nationality and ethnicity. He does not want us to try to confine him within borders and zip codes. He defines himself. He said to Joshua, I am commander of the army of the Lord. That's his name. And in his name, I have now come. Don't ask, my friend, whose side I'm on. What matters is whose side you're on, God speaking. Not which side I'm on, but whose side are you on? I am the commander of the army of the Lord. And that's why I've come. So the question is, who's on the Lord's side? Are you? Who will serve the king? Would you? Joshua chapter 6 tells us. Then the Lord said to Joshua, see, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its kings and its fighting men. Now, brothers and sisters, God is about to give Joshua the rules of engagement. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. We have been here now on the seventh day. Have seven priests, God said. Carry the ram's horn in front of the ark. Notice how specific the rules of engagement were. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets. Not whatever instrument you want, but trumpets of ram's horn in front of the ark on the seventh day. Not any day you wish. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times, not six or eight, seven times with the priests, the priests blowing the trumpets. And the priests shall blow the trumpets, the Bible says. And when you hear the sound of the long blast on the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout. Notice, everybody must shout. Everyone. Shouting, by the way, is not a black thing. It's not a Pentecostal thing. Shouting isn't a poor people's thing. Everyone should lift up a voice and praise God. Everyone should shout. You see, shout gives voice to our faith. The Bible says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so, say so. If you've been redeemed, say so. The hymn says, I have a song I love to sing. Since I have been redeemed, now that you've been redeemed, sing it, say it. And the Bible says, when you shout, the wall of the city will collapse. The army will go up and everybody will go straight in. The march around Jericho follow the custom in the ancient Near East. Context. The people of the ancient Near East claimed things by circling them. Circle it and claim it. Circle it and claim it. Circling Jericho, though, was an unusual military strategy. God said nothing about weapons. Walls in those times were battered in, but God didn't address how they would get through the walls. God's formula often seems unrealistic, non-viable. Circling a city once for six days and seven times on the seventh day sounds more like working out to me once a day than a military plan. Vladimir Putin, as you must know, had been building up troops outside of Ukraine, before he launched the war. He had even spoken to presidents, heads of states, perhaps to have them think he was still open to the diplomacy. Then came the moment. 
the day the war began. After day one for Israel, it was not yet the moment. Day two, three, four, not yet the moment. They went home to their tents. Day five and six came, same thing. They went back home. Time is everything, God's timing. I assure you, the wall of Jericho will fall if we employ God's formula. Even if it seems impractical, if we employ God's formula, walls are gonna come down. He wants us to circle what he said we should circle and circle it silently if he says so and circle it seven times when he says so. Shout when he says so. If we employ God's formula, if we comply, if we follow the rules of engagement, Jericho will come down. Thank God Israel didn't stop circling after a few days. They kept on circling one day at a time. God doesn't bring down walls because we are tired. So keep on circling. Keep on marching to Zion. When the fullness of time is come, the fullness, seven days with seven trips represent the fullness. On the seventh day too, so it's seven days, seven trips, seven day. Mark Batterson, who wrote the book Circle Maker, said God's promises don't have expiration dates. God's promises to heal, to bless, to forgive, to elevate, to promote. God's promises to deliver. God's promises don't have expiration dates. So wait on God. Wait until change comes. Job said, I will wait. There's an old hymn that we used to sing when I was a child. Oh, wait, meekly wait and murmur not. Another hymn says, be silent, be silent. We must learn the value of silence. We must learn the value of patience. Just as they concluded the final circle, they shouted. We are not told what they exactly said, but we are told that when they shouted, the walls came down. That shout expressed confidence in God. It was a leap in faith. They placed their faith in his word and shouted because he said so. Not because they had heard, not because their military leaders told them walls have fallen in the past when people shouted. They were trusting God. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory sheds on our way. God will get us across the river. He will get us across the Jordan River. And he will bring the walls down for the gospel to reach contemporary Rahabs. Rahabs behind walls in cities that don't today allow the preaching of the gospel. Already, the internet is bringing walls down. Who would have thought a few years ago that I could have sat in New York and preached virtually in South Africa and other parts of the world? You ask, how will the gospel be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations to usher in the end? Walls are coming down right now. We will get to the promised land. We will enter the golden city. We will walk on streets, he promised. We will eat the fruit of the tree of life. We will be blessed by the leaves, which are for the healing of the nation. We will stand around the throne of God. We will meet on the sea that looks like glass. Yes, brothers and sisters, from continent to continent, every island, every peninsula, God's children will be gathered home and we shall live in his presence and worship him from ceaseless age to ceaseless age, blessing his name, thanking Jesus for dying for us, amazed that we are saved. That's God's promise to his church. The Bible says, God will wipe away all tears from your eyes. Not only those tears that death brings, but the tears of pain and failure, the tears of a sense of rejection, the tears of, of people just hurting you because they can hurt you. All these tears will be wiped away and God, himself will be our light. God himself, no more famine, no more drought, no more pandemic, 
no more. And it's not just for Joshua. It's not just for the leadership. It's for all God's children, all of us, all of us. Imagine God wants to save all of us. If you hiring people, you don't want to hire everybody. So you have them apply and then you interview. It's a process of screening and sort of eliminating. You don't want any and every doctor. You don't want to go sit back and open your mouth in front of any and everybody who says he's a dentist. You want references. You want to know. You want to know. You don't want to get married to anybody, anybody. You want to be sure this is the one for you. Well, God wants to save everybody, regardless, irrespective, in spite of. He wants to save all of us. And so God is going to save some people who have been giving us trouble all their lives, all our lives. God is going to save them. Some of these people we know to be disagreeable. Some of these people we know to be disgruntled. Some of these people we don't think we want to be in their company. God is going to save them because he's not finished with everybody yet. Some of their walls haven't yet come down, but God has walls in their hearts that he will bring down. The Holy Spirit will knock them down. So if you are a difficult person and you're struggling with it, you want to be better. You want to be nicer. You want to be kinder. You want to be saved and know you're saved. I want to urge you this morning, don't quit. Keep on marching in prayer. Keep on marching in fasting. Keep on believing. God is going to bring the walls down. He is going to sanctify you. He's going to turn your heart into a heart that feels his love. Pray for those who have not yet surrendered. Don't give up on anybody. March around. Circle your son. Circle your prodigal son. Circle your daughter. Circle your daughter who you believe is too vain and worldly. Circle her with prayer. Pray for your parents. Pray for your spouses. Pray for your siblings. Pray for your church. Pray for your conference. Pray for fellow believers of who you have met and probably will never meet. Pray so that we all enter the promised land. So we all march in through those gates, gates made of pearl, walls of jasper, streets of gold. That's the promise. It's going to be better than Jericho being conquered because the devil himself will be defeated. The church militant will become the church triumphant. All God's people. And that's a miracle. The unlikeliest miracle. The unlikeliest corporate miracle. I'm promising you this morning, God is going to save some people you didn't think could be saved. God isn't finished yet. And you probably think you may not make it, but all you got to do is keep on marching. God is going to save you. So whatever you're dealing with today, whatever you've prayed about this week, keep on praying. And if you haven't yet mentioned it, start praying about it. Call it out to God in your private prayer. Tell God about your secret sins, about your addictions your Achilles heels, your besetting sin, lay him out before God and ask him to deliver you. He will deliver you. It's all the time I've had with you, I have with you. It was a blessed time for me, believe me. I have to preach tomorrow morning and I am fired up already to preach tomorrow morning in person. I'll be in Sabbath school and then I'll be going off to another church to preach. And I'll be thinking of you, I'll be praying for you. Please promise me that you'll be praying for me. God bless you all. And Elder Easy Mbinga, thank you. And Sister C. Sithobo, uh, thank you. God loves all of you. Those of you whose names I will never learn on this side, I'll get to know you on the other side. Be well and be blessed. <laughs>